please take your Bible. I want to look at a couple of portions of Scripture this morning that are uh, broad in, in many verses, but I am going to narrow the lesson down to one individual thought as quickly as possible. If you would go to Ephesians in chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 20, the Bible says, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put a, putting away a lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you." In this portion of Scripture, I want you to notice verse 27, where the Bible says, Neither give place to the devil. Now, this portion of Scripture is speaking about Christians. After you have been saved, what you ought to do and what you ought not to do, that you uh, put off the old man, the conversation means life, that you would put off how the old man acted or acts, and that you would put on the new man, which is uh, the new birth, uh, Holy Spirit of God. And he says, neither give place to the devil, speaking to a Christian. And then you hone in on verse 32 in the middle of the verse. It says, forgiving one another. So there are uh, many things that you could focus on, and I'm just going to focus on that one thought in this lesson, forgiving one another. This is having the spirit of forgiveness, developing the spirit of forgiveness, and letting things go. And so you pick up on that, forgiving one another. Now, I also want you to Go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, we're going to again read a lengthy portion of scriptures, but it's going to drill down to this one thought, and we will attempt to develop it from here. Matthew chapter 18, I want you to notice in verse 23. The Bible says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, 
which owed him 10,000 talents. And that's an insurmountable amount. It's a lot. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. That portion of Scripture is likened unto salvation by grace through faith because we owe a sin debt that we cannot pay. The wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God for all of eternity. If a person wants to pay for their own sin, it takes eternal damnation in hell forever and ever to pay for that sin debt. And we know Jesus paid it all. That's by grace through faith. We understand that. Then he says, verse 28, But the same servant, the one that was forgiven, went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. This is a less amount, considerably less. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So the thought here again, picking up in this portion of Scripture, is based on forgiveness. And I want to go from that thought and pick up on a word that caught my attention And that word is in verse 34. Now this is pertaining to Christian folk. The lesson is pertaining to Christian folk. And I believe that he is speaking on that behalf as well. In verse 34, the Bible says, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. That's our thought this morning. In uh, the lesson, I, if there would be a title, I would title it, The Tormentors. It's in verse 34, The Tormentors. It is in this matter of a Christian, born-again child of God, knowing that they have been forgiven of all their sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we could go around the congregation this morning and ask when you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you could uh, remember or at least know that you have trusted and you are trusting in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you're trusting from a biblical standpoint, then you know that you will not go to hell, but that you are going to heaven based on the finished work of Christ that you have been forgiven. You have been forgiven of your sins. And it was my sins and your sins that placed Christ on the cross because our sins were laid on Him. All of our sins, past, present, and future sins, were placed on Him, and we are all sinners. Sometimes after that we get saved, or even before, we start to look around and think that we're not that bad of a sinner. And uh, maybe we have not sinned to the degree that somebody else has sinned and so forth, 
But uh, we are all sinners. We have uh, sinned against God because we have a sin nature, and uh, that sin nature has to be dealt with. It has to be paid for, and Christ did that. Our sins were laid on Him. We are forgiven. One of the greatest things that brings peace is knowing that you are forgiven, and praise God for that. However, a lot of times, as people are, and even Christians, even though that we are forgiven, we do not want to forgive others. And throughout the Bible, often the Lord Jesus speaks about forgiving and forgiving others. And uh, he mentions that if we don't forgive, then the Lord will not forgive and, and so forth. And it does not have to do with salvation. And when a child of God will not forgive, then I want you to notice this word tormentors, the tormentors. It's in the matter of being forgiven on your way to heaven, but not wanting to forgive others, the tormentors. So just for a moment, I want to mention a few of these tormentors to you. It does not mean that if you don't forgive, you lose your salvation and go to hell. It does not mean that at all. If you're saved, you are saved. And if you're not saved, you need to get saved. But it does not mean that you lose your salvation, but uh, it means you're tormented. He says, deliver him to the tormentors. Here's some of the tormentors. Uh, everything always gets to you. Uh, everything is getting the best of you. You're aggravated by everything. You stay upset most of the time. You stay angry. You have lost your joy, or for the most part, you've lost your joy, or you don't often have joy. You're not happy. You are bitter. You are uneasy. You are difficult to be around. You are depressed and you're depressing. You're not pleased. You cannot be satisfied. You are upset about what you have or what you don't have. You get mad at getting what you don't deserve. You're mad at others for having what you don't have. Uh, these are some of the results of the tormentors. It's not to do with salvation. It has to do with the tormentors. And uh, these tormentors get to you. And it causes you to lose your joy. You don't see good. You're definitely not uh, half full, it's empty. That aligns, by the way, to the devil. The, the Bible says in Luke 16, 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. This is the rich man. Here's another one. Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is in the future. Here's one more, Revelation 20:10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The tormentors. It would be likened unto living in a, quote, quote, hell on earth instead of heaven on earth. And uh, God wants you to have joy on your way to heaven. God has made it to where you can have joy 
on the way to heaven. And the devil certainly doesn't want you to have any joy. The verse said in Ephesians 4.27, Neither give place to the devil. One man wrote this. He said on that verse of neither give place to the devil, man's wrath, anger, bitter, clamor, man's wrath is the devil's opportunity to make him his servant. Notice a couple of portions of Scripture. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And in verse 19. Galatians 5 and in 19 are the works of the flesh that pertains to that old man, the old conversation, or what you used to be before you got saved. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, and the works of the flesh do manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, or those that practice these things that are not saved. I will pause to say that a saved person is capable of every sin of a lost person. Capable. One more portion, Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, In verse 5, the Bible says, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you put on the new man. So you see in the list, things like anger and hatred and variance, seditions, heresies, Vengeance is one, lying, cheating, stealing. These are the things of the flesh. And you give place to the devil when you act like him. And I'm, I'm talking uh, about Christian folk. A Christian is capable of the sins of a lost person. The Bible has got proof of people that were saved people that committed sins that you would think only a lost person could commit. The flesh did not get saved. You have the Holy Spirit of God when you got saved, and the devil cannot get your soul. And we praise God for that. But he can sure get your flesh, and he appeals to the flesh, and he goes after the flesh. The devil cannot get your soul if you're saved. Amen. But he can certainly influence you to act like him. And that's his goal. He, he knows about eternal security. The book of Job tells us that. That the devil, uh, talking with God, said you, you've put, placed a hedge about him. Can't get him. So he, he knows enough about eternal security that he can't get your soul. But his 
desire is to get your peace and to get your joy, to get your influence, and to get you to act like him instead of acting like a Christian. He wants you, the devil wants you, to rebel against God like he did. And that is in Isaiah chapter 14. It's verses 13 and 14 at least where he said, I believe seven times I will. And he says, I will ascend uh, up to the heavens. I will be like the Most High. And that is in the rebellion of the heart of Satan, and he wants you to rebel against God. As one preacher put it, it is not necessarily that the devil wants you to follow him, per se, but he wants you to be your own God. He wants you to live independent of God. At the beginning, he said, ye shall be as gods. And so if the devil can get you to do what you want to do instead of what God wants you to do, then he's getting you to act like him. It's not necessarily following the devil. It's just following you, that you will be your own God that every man would do what is right in his own eyes. It's, I know what the Bible says, but I know better. I know better than what the preacher knows. I know better than the Sunday school teacher. I know better. I know. And this is what I'm going to do. And it's simply rebelling against God. The devil wants everyone to go to hell. It, it's 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. You can notice this, but the devil, he knows where he is assigned. He's not there yet, and he cannot get saved. But since the devil is assigned to the lake of fire and he's not in there yet, he wants to take as many of God's people created people with him. The devil hates God. When the devil rebelled and got his punishment, the devil hates God. And the best way for the devil to get to God is to get you, his people. And especially you, his saved children. You don't have to answer this, but if you are a parent... What would be the worst attack on you, your kid? You know, you, you would say, you do whatever you want to me, leave the kids alone. And so uh, the same concept, the devil is after God's people. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Bible says, in whom the God of this world, that's Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. That's why they do not receive a gospel track or they slam the door or they act angrily against you. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. All people are lost, John 3.18. All people have a sin nature. All people, unless dealt with by the blood of Christ, are on their way to a devil's hell. All people. Good, bad, or indifferent. So he wants to take people to hell. But he also wants to make Christians rebel against God, to turn on each other so there is no spirit of unity, and to render your life of no effect, your church of no effect, weaken the nation, and so forth. And that's what he wants to do. Some accounts of that, and I, because of time, I, I won't go to all of these, but in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, it was Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Spirit of God, lying to God in the early church, selling a portion of property and bringing it 
And God gave Peter some special discernment at that time, and he understood that um, they were doing that under the pretense of giving all, but they did not, and they, they lied to God. That's, that's the act of the devil. There's a case in 1 Chronicles 21.1 where King David, uh, I would say from the biblical account that King David it would be the, uh, the, the best king that they recognized that they had, and he will rule and reign again with, with Jesus. That the Bible says that Satan provoked him to number Israel, to number the nation of Israel, provoked him. Satan stood up and provoked him. In the provoking of the numbering of the nation, most would say that David did that in an act that he received punishment and chastening from God because he was trusting in the numbers instead of trusting in God. Judas was obviously a lost one. He was never saved and lost. But the Bible says that in this account of Judas that Satan actually took over him in possession. The Bible says in Luke 22, 3, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being, one, uh, being of the number of the twelve. Satan entered and took possession of him. He was not saved. Judas had invited Satan into his life by a preconceived notion of betraying Jesus before that it took place to sell him for money. The devil took advantage of that and uh, was welcome into his life, and so he went into his life. The devil cannot get your saved soul, but he can influence your unsaved flesh. It is the devil's design and it is his desire to develop within you a spirit of unforgiveness because it will torment you. The Bible says that as the Lord Jesus gives that account of the kingdom of heaven, this one was forgiven. You and I are forgiven an insurmountable amount. And then in our life, it, offenses come, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. And so we think about Psalm 119, verse 165, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And we say, yeah, I know that's a good verse, but... And we discard that, and we go on to what is due us. What is due us is that I won't be spoken to this way by anyone. I certainly will not be done that way by anyone. We will say, I'm not a Christian doormat, and you're not. And I don't deserve that, and you don't. I guess Jesus did. Uh, you should get what's coming to you. Hopefully you don't. And all of that builds up uh, animosity, anger, bitterness. And the Bible says that if you and I don't let go of that, it is tormenting. Now, you allow that to speak to your heart if it does in any way, and it may not pertain to you one iota. But for most of us, it does. And so here are your three quick thoughts as we close on this matter. Now, all we did was pick out of that large list about being turned over to the tormentors. Now, life's too short to live in torment. Praise God you're going to heaven if you're saved. Amen. But you can go with some joy along the way. You can go with some more influence along the way. You can go being more pleasant to be around along the way. And he said, turn them over to the tormentors. It's not God tormenting you. It's the devil using these things to bring the torment. And you may say, I'm going to choose to live that way. That's a choice. People choose to not get saved, and they don't have to. People choose to get saved. 
You can choose to enjoy or you can choose to hold on to bitterness, anger, clamor, wrath, and you can hold on to that if, if you want. So here, here's the three quick thoughts. Matthew chapter 6, of course, Matthew chapter 6. And this subject is talked about a lot in the Bible, so it must be important. In Matthew chapter 6, this would be, this is Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, uh, the Bible says, Matthew 6, 12, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That has not to do with salvation. If you are saved, you've asked to be saved, you are saved. This is speaking about after that you've been saved and you develop a spirit of unforgiveness and the Lord allows, if that's what you want, to be turned over to the tormentors. The tormentors is an act of the devil to get you mad, angry, bitter, to where you do not have a proper influence on others and you certainly don't have joy in your life. So the number one thought is practice forgiveness. I'm going to practice forgiveness. In the practice of forgiveness, part of that is to work on, and it's practice is what I said, is to not hold grudges, but let them go. Let them go. And uh, if the other person says, I won't forgive you, but you have attempted forgiveness and in, in your heart, then you've done your part. You're going to practice forgiveness. If you look at Luke chapter 17, on the same matter, Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, verse 3... The Bible says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. So this is going to a brother and confronting the matter and saying, You, you have done this, or uh, you have offended in this. And the, the typical way, if it's man to man, woman to woman, you can go by yourself. And in, in church discipline... If it's unresolved, then you take witnesses, and if it's unresolved, you bring it to the church. This case right here is speaking about that you feel offended by someone, that you can address it and say that that was offensive. And uh, if he says, I'm sorry, then you forgive him. Verse 4, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, this isn't written to where you and I keep a checklist of saying, okay, well, now it was eight times today. It is meaning that it's a hypothetical situation that if the individual has offended again and asked for forgiveness, then you forgive. It is developing a spirit of forgiveness. That's what he's speaking about. And um, then you notice in verse 5, And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. This is in direct relation to the thought of practicing forgiveness because that's when they ask for the increase of faith in the ability to forgive the way that the Lord is speaking about forgiving. So I said, number one, practice forgiveness. Why? 
Well, because you want to get rid of the tormentors. You, you don't want to be tormented every day. You don't want to be mad every day. You don't want to be disheartened every day. You don't want to be bitter and angry every day. Then number two, not only practice forgiveness, but pray for faith in the matter of forgiveness. In other words, praying for grace. You know, Lord, I, I really am mad at this individual. Or, Lord, I'm really upset. Lord, they really got me this time. You pray for grace. When you pray for grace, then the verse comes up, looking unto Jesus. And when you look unto Jesus, you will see that Jesus was hanging on a cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So you practice forgiveness. You pray for extra grace in the matter of forgiveness. And then uh, James 4, James chapter 4, Hebrews, James chapter 4 and verse 7. You present yourself to God in submission to Him and thereby are able to resist the devil in God's strength and not your own. The peace comes from God. The anger comes from the devil. The tormenting is listening to the devil. And the truth will do what? It sets you free. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. When you submit yourselves therefore to God, how does that look? It means submitting to the Word of God, what God says. It, it is submitting to the authority that God has for you. If you still, if you're out in the, in the workforce, and uh, I, I praise God I'm not, I'm retired, but I don't want to, you know, rub that in your face, but praise God, you, you should be able to retire when you're young, you know, but uh, work is good. It really is. Work's not bad. But if you're still in the workforce, you probably have a boss. Now, you may not like the boss, but you have to understand that that currently is the boss that God has there. I don't know why this person's the boss. I'm smarter than they are. I'm better than they are. I'm. You have to submit to that boss until God does something different. Or you can go in hating life every day and be tormented. Now that's easy preaching, hard living. But I have been in the workforce and I, I know that. And if you are retired, praise God for that. But you, you may need to get up in the morning and pray for some added grace before you go to work. You're raising children. You need to pray for grace. You are a boss. You need to pray for grace so that you're not the boss that you used to have. Submitting to God is submitting to the Word of God. It's also submitting to the authority that God has in your life. Should children submit to the parents? Yes, they should. Why is that? Because they are the authority authority that God has placed in their life. That's what submitting to God looks like. Then you can resist the devil. And when you resist the devil by submitting to God, he will flee. And if you don't, he won't. And you will be tormented. I don't want to be tormented. Uh, you know, life is short, and, and praise God, we can have some joy along the way to heaven. We only looked at one portion of that, and it is this matter of forgiveness. And uh, if you and I don't practice that, 
then we live in a torment because the Lord says, turn them over to the tormentors. Why? Because God said to forgive. Because God has forgiven you, and you should forgive others. We have to practice forgiveness. We pray for faith and grace in the matter, and then we present ourselves to God into submission to Him. Then we can resist the devil, the tormentors. Help us not to be tormented. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the Word of God. We ask for special grace in this lesson message that we looked at today, praying that you will bless your children, bless their families, meet their needs, bless them on the jobs that they participate in and in their families and in their homes, and help us, dear God, to put into practice what you've told us to do so that we're not given over to the torments of life that comes from the devil. Help us, dear Lord, to have the peace that you want us to have. In Jesus' name, amen.